<laughs> so, just to help you with this, let me just, let me just, let me just bring you in with a bit of church. My kind of church. It goes. You are probably expecting songs of faith and devotion. A holy hymn sounding just like a prayer. Your voice will take you there. Spoken to your own personal Jesus. <laughs> You're probably hoping that if God was one of us, <laughs> he definitely is not me. But you know what? God lives in every single one of us. So be careful of that devil inside, devil inside. Because if you are ashamed and you feel sympathy for the devil, time is on my side. Yes, it is. I'm a sinner. I'm a saint. I do not feel ashamed because in fact, your background, it ain't squeaky clean shit. Sometimes we all gotta swim upstream. Someday we'll probably build a bridge over troubled waters. But for now, we'll just be rolling, rolling, rolling up the river, river deeper. Because when the mountain was high, I still believed I knew you were waiting for me. I, to quote, a young Aretha Franklin. Put your hands together. One, two, three, four. The only man who could ever reach me was a son of a preacher man. She said, The only man who could ever reach me was a son of a preacher man. Yes, I was. <laughs> and I might be again tomorrow. But tonight, you're going to love all human beings as they are, unlike those buffoons in Uganda, Nigeria, actually the whole rest of Africa, yeah. and only yeah. here in South Africa are we allowed to love who we want to love. Amen. Fabulous latest word in the queer community in Cape Town. If it was vast, darling. 
How is your lunch? Vast, darling. <laughs> How are those shoes? Vast, darling. How is the party? Vast. So, I decided to call it vast. But because the history is quite vast, what must be understood is that I am Oti, is my name. Nvenya. And in a country like South Africa, everything's got to do with history, identity, where you come from, where you don't come from. And the most insane thing about it is that everybody sort of took to the New South Africa very easily. It was like everybody just jumped in. But for me, who was in high school in 1994, I was like, just turning 16. It only took me like 20 years to actually go, what the hell just happened? <laughs> like seriously, like hold up, Vindoni! Because somebody was like, what was apartheid like? You see, I was born in 1978. So 1978 is two years after 1976, which was the Soweto, you know, drama. So that means that, oh, it's also actually, it's actually the 40th anniversary of Iran. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I digress. But so I've got to actually experience in childhood. And my dad in 1978 moved to Cape Town from the Eastern Cape, because he had got into trouble, you see, with, um, with the Diocese of, um, of Grahamstown. And the reason why I got into trouble with the Diocese of Grahamstown is because my dad has actually failed to mention this until I actually had to ask him. He's like, can you tell us how you landed up in Cape Town and the whole story why we were in Yanga? So my dad followed Archbishop Tutu, then he wasn't Archbishop. But he followed Archbishop Tutu at a university, which is the only university, well, it's the black university of South Africa, you know, the most preeminent one in Southern Africa, the University of Forte. So Kenneth Kawunda went to the University of Forte, um, Robert Mugabe went to the University of Forte. It's literally like, I don't know, the only black uni the university um, that was around. And I go, yeah, so dad, you were there, and why were you there? And my dad goes, no. So essentially what happened was that this is when the apartheid laws kicked in. And my dad followed Archbishop Tutu as the chaplain of the University of Forte, because the St. Peter's School for Priests was right next door, sort of same area in Alice. And my dad inherited a lovely person called Steve Miko and his mistress, Mampela Rampel, who started the whole black consciousness movement, whole situation, resistance to, you know, I mean, we're talking about land rights and people claiming back land. I mean, this is when the land situation suddenly happened where the St. Peter's School for the Priests, for Anglican priests, suddenly lost all its dormitories, etc. So people couldn't stay on campus because the party government had decided to take the land. So this was the whole thing happening. And I'm like, Dad, you should have told me this before, like 2014, when I then decided to, um, how do I put it? I was called by Mampela Rampele at St. George's Cathedral to come and be a volunteer for her new party, Akham. I couldn't understand. I'm like, how does my dad know these people? How does this happen? And so he inherited all of that. My dad started working, obviously, with the resistance. Um, besides, the South African Council of Churches became very political during the struggle days. So my dad, how am I got involved in this whole situation? And I go, bang. And then I realize, wait a second. And then he says, so my dad then was moved from the University of Forte. And this was around about 1973, 74. 
he was moved from there to Queenstown. Funny enough, I think my dad is actually being played by some American actor in a movie called A Dry White Season, because when they tried to get Steve Biko out of the country to go to Lesotho, he was taken through a, a, a town called Queenstown, where he was moved to, and Queenstown and St. Andrew's Church, and he was the priest of St. Andrew's Church who helped him sneak through the, um, you know, through the, the, the border to Lesotho. So this is how it happened. I'm thinking, hmm, 1978. So how is it that a drag queen gets born in 1978 to an Anglican priest? <laughs> but the family comes from, how do I put it? Ish. So the name is Odid. Amabele Odid, that's my that's how I make sense of it. Otherwise, people in Cape Town, most, most South Africans think I'm probably from Uganda or from where Donald is from, which is Ethiopia, uh, or Somalia, I'm not sure. <laughs> but that's what happens. And they could always ask, like this. I'm like, no, it actually means of greatness, of high esteem. But Tosa is a very, how do I put it? It's very much like French. Everything is conjugated. Everything goes with female and male, nothing is ever just nothing. So, essentially, my name is only for guys. So only men or males can be called Odid, according to the conjugation. So it would be Indombi Zodidi, so my name would have been Zodidi if I was female. Which is what the beauty of Odidiva is. Because it starts off male, Odidi and then ends all female, but, as I said, in between, in the Garden of Good and Evil. So I got to learn a language called Gale. And you know, in South Africa, it always starts with the same thing. Always starts with the same thing. It's not really a language, it's like dialect. It's like, um, it's like, how do I put it? It's like, reading is not a menu. It's like what you see in Paris is burning, but this is the language that was actually used by undercover queers in South Africa during the whole party here. So it was like, so how's it, how do you do it? So it goes like this. Okay. So you know, in South Africa, you always want to, you can tell them a story. You can tell anybody a story in South Africa, and one thing they want to know, what color was it? <laughs> so it starts off with the color coding. So, Wendy, Natalie for native, Cora for color, it's right. And uh, this. So your boyfriend is called a catchback. Because you hold him tight. <laughs> and uh, sunglasses are called Gladys's. I think Gladys not. Your hair, Harriet. And the shoes, Haka. And what do you call a drink? It's Dora. And if you like, over it. You say you're ashes. I'm ashes for that Dora, darling. And Priscilla Lodge's prison. So this is the kind of, this is what I learned at the age of 16. Yay! I'm so glad I went to Artscape Theatre. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was that people, we have created this world in the LGBTQ community that has a history, that has a language that is used by Tamar Braxton like every day. Mm. <laughs> it's used by everybody. I mean, somebody came up to me and said, contour, contour makeup? What is contour makeup? No, no, it's contouring, huh? Huh? Who does that? Oh, Kim Kardashian's doing contouring. Oh, really? It's called drag makeup, bitch. Drag! <laughs> and it comes from Shakespeare, dressed as a girl. He wrote in his notes. And it's, that sense for me is that, that's what made Daniel and I come together, that we realized that we have been given this blessing in South Africa of a 1996 orientation, sexual orientation clause that accepts us as who we are. But because our ancestral history, where black Sangomans were literally like running civilizations and societies as mediums, as the high priests of of certain communities. 
certain communities were more like Sparta, you know, didn't have no queerness thing happening. You know, like the Zulus. You know, it's, it happens like that. But this history doesn't exist. It was a part of South Africa, so there was no Miriam Makeba. There was no Hugh Masekela. There was no Bob Marley. Bob Marley was bad. So, every, so the whole thing of like, Miriam Makeba, we have no knowledge of it. Nina Simone was bad. We'd never heard of it before. So, when I look back, I'm like, <laughs> We didn't know shit in 1994. 1990 literally gave us life. Honey, we had no idea Mary Makeba was the Rihanna of America. <laughs> and that she was the only woman, like only performer, not from the United States at JFK's like, birthday party in Madison Square Gardens. Where, you know, Marilyn Monroe was saying, Happy birthday to you. <laughs> had no clue. We had no clue. She was there. I mean, this is the reason why there was like a sort of Black Panthers movement, was because Mira Makeba arrived. And next thing you know, Nina Simone stopped wearing things. And she started going all natural. Next thing you know, Nina Simone was actually best friends with Mira Makeba. Didn't know. So, rumor has it, it's not a rumor, it's actually fact, that the Venda Jews, the Jewish community of the Venda people in Limbobo, South Africa, the province, is from our descendants. They've done two documentaries. They've done DNA, don't, 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 the whole thing, people from Cambridge and Oxford. But they are the descendants of the priests of King Solomon. There's a book out called Indaba My Children by Credo Mutwa, which tells the full sort of myth mythological and history of Southern Africa. That thing called the Covenant of the Ark traveled all the way to the Great Rift Valley and landed up in the mountains of Daba Zimbi in Limpopo. Even Robert Mugabe tried to get to it. He actually got one of the copies. How do we not know? that Cecil John Rhodes came here because he heard a rumor via Marco Polo, right, that King Solomon's mind were in Zimbabwe. Or maybe he just missed it, because the place was called Mapamuwe in Limpopo. How do we know? If our history keeps on starting at 1652, when Jan van Riebeck decided to take over the trading posts that the Chinese have been using to sell around Africa for so many years. Here, run by the Poisan, by a guy, by a chief called Hachimatu. What are we going to learn? Because at the same time, I should think, misogyny is, how do I put it, homophobic. But maybe in South Africa, we need to realize that we have this queer history already in. That's why this whole thing is vast. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>